the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Death, but not sin. This was the motto of St. Dominic Salvio. The same words can be applied to our saint, who lived over 600 years before, who reigned over the kingdom of France for 44 years. These were the words of a child saint, but they're similar words spoken to a young Louis IX by his mother. His mother, Queen Blanche, told her young son, I love you, my dear son, with all the tenderness a mother is capable of. But I would infinitely rather see you fall down dead at my feet than that you should ever commit a mortal sin. These words to many may seem extreme, that perhaps this mother has taken it too far. But in reality, these are the words of a faithful Catholic mother, the words of a good queen. In her counsel to her son, we can hear a mother's tender love for her child, but above all, her love for God. Her loyalty above all to the King of Kings, Christ. This queen knew that her first role as a mother was to get her son to heaven, and as queen, to make sure that her son's kingdom would ultimately be governed by the eternal laws of God. At the death of his father, Louis VIII, in 1226, Louis IX would become king of France at just 12 years old, but was not without great help. At the request of Louis VIII, Queen Blanche was declared regent for her son and helped him until he became of age. Louis's mother would be one of the greatest influences in his life. Blanche kept her son close to her, accepting much of the responsibility for his education, choosing tutors to teach him subjects suited to the upbringing of a king. Above all, Blanche knew what was most important for her son, most important for his salvation and the good of the whole kingdom, his religious formation. Queen Blanche would take her son to pray the divine office, and they would attend two masses each day. Louis was raised by his mother to understand the truth of his office as king that his eternal salvation was dependent on how he ruled the kingdom. And the greatest enemy of a Catholic king to any ruler is sin. So Louis forbade at his court anything dangerous to morals. He allowed no obscenity or profanity. His friends said that in his 22 years that he had never once heard Louis swear either by God or his mother or of the saints. This policy extended to the whole kingdom. Louis had stringent penalties for all to respect the Catholic faith. Once when one of his courtiers had a complaint to Louis for his laws against blasphemers, that they should be branded on the lips, Louis replied, I would willingly have my own lips branded out to root out the blasphemy from my kingdom. This may sound extreme, but Louis understood that blasphemy is a public crime against God which calls down God's justice. If a king allowed that, then the country would call down justice upon itself. Therefore, such a crime is a matter of national security. Kingdoms or nations do not have eternal souls, so a kingdom or nation cannot suffer in the next life to make retribution to God. A kingdom cannot enter purgatory, so it must be chastised only in this life. And when that happens, the good and the bad suffer alike. Louis understood that all sin affects the whole kingdom but above all, the mystical body of Christ. One day, his friend and biographer, 
Jean de Guanville, said that one day the king asked him, What is God? John replied, That which is so good that there could be nothing better. Louis replied, Well said. Now tell me, would you rather be a leper or commit a mortal sin? John stated, I would rather commit 30 mortal sins than be a leper. Louis would have none of his friends answer. He told him, You spoke hastily and as a fool, for you should know that there is no leprosy so hideous as being in mortal sin. When a soul is in mortal sin, it is like unto the devil. Wherefore, no leprosy can be so hideous. All illness and disease of the body ends at death, he told his friend. But the one who dies in mortal sin, this illness and hideousness lasts forever. He recalled what his mother had told him as a boy and said to his friend, So I pray you, as strongly as I can, for the love of God and for the love of me, to set your heart that you prefer any evil that can happen to the body, whether it be leprosy or any other sickness, rather than that mortal sin should enter your soul. Louis always knew that in order for his kingdom to be successful against the external enemies of Christ, he had to have success against the internal enemies. In response to the external enemies of Christ, Louis launched two crusades against the Saracens and Turks who had been invading Christian lands, exploiting the women, and killing in the, and killing in the most brutal ways. When Pope Urban II called for the First Crusade, he related that Christians were being tortured and beheaded. Their blood was being poured on the altars of churches and into the baptismal fonts. In 1248, Louis set off for Egypt. Yet even in war, he maintained strict moral standards. The king issued orders that all acts of violence committed by his soldiers should be punished and restitution made for the persons injured. He forbade the killing of any infidel taken prisoner and gave instructions that all who might desire to embrace the Christian faith should be given instruction, and if they wished it, baptized. When Louis was taken prisoner in 1250 and his army was routed, during his captivity, he recited the divine office every day with two chaplains and had the prayers of the mass read to him. The guards were in awe of, his, of the majesty in which he conducted himself. One time an emir rushed into his tent and demanding Louis knight him or be stabbed. Louis calmly informed that only a follower of Jesus Christ could perform the duties of a Christian knight. Eventually Louis was ransomed and went back to France only when his mother died. On March 24th, 1267, he took the cross again and on March 15th, 1270, once more left on crusade. We should be no more surprised to learn that the same king added to the coronation oath of French monarchies, a vow to purge and expel heretics from the kingdom. Centuries after our saint, another king of France omitted the vow when he swore his coronation oath. This was the fate of Louis XVI, who lost the kingdom and was beheaded. The kingdom of heaven must be defended like any other kingdom. How different 13th century France was from the governments of today. Far from the church being separated from the state, which is condemned, the church and state were united. Louis swore to do these things, 
as did all the Catholic kings. The coronation rite itself calls for it. Louis was commanded to fight sin in his kingdom and protect the church. During the coronation, the archbishop declared, let you demolish iniquity and let you fight for and protect the holy church of God and her faithful ones. And no less, let you destroy the enemies who are under a false faith. When the king is handed his scepter, it is with that that he is to terrify evil in his kingdom. As the archbishop addresses the king with the words of father to the son from Psalm 44, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of justice is the scepter of, the, of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved justice and hated iniquity. When the archbishop places the crown on the king's head, he states that he is now participating in the apostolic ministry, that the prelates are the pastors and rectors of the interior of souls, while the king cares for the exterior. How far we are from this type of society. When we look to the leaders of today, how many are concerned with the souls of the people, let alone their own souls? How many of us are taught that monarchy is completely bad? But this is a lie. How many kings and queens are saints versus how many presidents and democratic leaders? We should all eagerly desire to live under a truly Catholic government. In his book, Before Church and State, Andrew Willard Jones explains that the Catholic king's job was to produce peace on earth in emulation of the eternal peace of the saints in heaven, and in doing so, bring heaven and earth together, reducing the distinction between the church and the world, allowing grace a space to work in society. And so as the overall holiness of the people grows, the laws necessary to compel men to justice should be less and less necessary because the people live with the law of love in their hearts and in their actions. Does this not sound like a society under the triumph of the Immaculate Heart? It would make sense that in order to get this unprecedented peace in society, men must do what Our Lady of Fatima said, principally to stop offending God, followed by her five conditions of the rosary, scapular, offering up sufferings, the five first Saturdays, and finally consecration to her. One can see now how the loss of truly Catholic governments in the world was and is a terrible chastisement sent from God due to sin, and how the triumph of the Immaculate Heart, we will see the return of great Catholic leaders like St. Louis. Louis would die on his Eighth Crusade when after his victory over the enemy, he had succumbed to a fever. Louis received viaticum, kneeling by his camp bed. At his death, he raised up his eyes, repeating the words of the psalm. Lord, I will enter into thine house. I will adore in thy holy temple and will give glory to thy name. At 3 p.m., this king of France died with the same words as the king of kings. Into thy hands I commend my soul. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.